Um, so that's pretty easy, except when it isn't. So in Drupal 7, I'm sure you've probably ran into the situation where the jQuery library is a little bit different than the cores, and then you get these sort of version, you don't really get errors, but things start going wonky on the site, right? Because you've got two different libraries and, and it's hard to debug. Um, so versions are primarily gonna matter when you're pulling in all these different dependencies. Um, so as I kind of described, hypothetically, you've got you know Drupal core at the time of, of this presentation is 1.2 that was pulling in. Um, jQuery actually requires 1.3, and then basically they're not equal. Like there are some deprecated functions, or there's functions that 1.3 has that 1.2 doesn't have, um, or methods. Um, so what do you do? You'll typically install some sort of a contrib module that's going to show the different versions or pick the different versions. Um, and then there's the hacky workarounds, um, and there's just a lot of work, and the maintenance becomes a nightmare. And this is all Drupal 7 related. So now with Drupal 8, which uses a lot of dependencies, primarily Symfony. So you know, I'm sure you're familiar that the whole architecture of Drupal 8 is now around Symfony framework, which uses Doctrine, which also uses Twig, and all the requests are through Guzzle, and a whole lot more. And all of these are not Drupal core modules or contributed modules that you download from Drupal.org. These are all from the PHP community. So, this is actually really good because now Drupal 8 and the ecosystem is following along the same lines as the whole PHP sort of world. It's not, we're not in our own little world of you know, the Drupal way of doing things. It's now following a, a, an enterprise framework, Symfony. It's getting scalable. We've got more people contributing to it and you can utilize a lot of other libraries out there like Guzzle and things like that to do a lot of advanced uh, applications like Internet of Things type applications or even native applications, we can start pulling in libraries that other people work with. Um, but with that kind of flexibility and moving into that direction, things get complicated very quickly. Um, and as I mentioned, you got symphony commodants that you require and then Drush requires all sorts of different things and just everything gets very, very complicated. Um, so this goes into how it works. Uh, so essentially, the way Composer works is similar to NPM, if you're familiar with Node. So NPM, it just pulls in the things. There's a library. You, you identify where it's going to pull that library from, GitHub, and you'll see sort of the repositories <coughs> in those files. Um, Yarn and Bower. Ruby has Bundler. And then in conjunction, we have Composer, or PHP has Composer. Um, so demo time. It's actually not a demo. I'm kind of walk through it because sometimes these composer sort of installs take forever, depending on Wi-Fi access and stuff. So I'm just going to kind of walk through those steps. And if you have any questions, you can you can stop me and then we can dive right in. Um, so essentially, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to have to install composer. How many of you have already installed composer and it's all working fine? Okay. So basic commands, pretty straightforward. Um, when you go to Composer, you just these are cut and paste directly from their site. Um, if you're using a Mac, you can use Homebrew. So that makes it easier. You don't have to do all these steps. You can do a Homebrew and it'll, it'll install everything for you. And then once that's installed, you can essentially create a PHP project from scratch. And this is, this is um, agnostic, so we're just talking straight PHP, not, not a Drupal project. Um, so essentially when you're using Composer for anything, so let's say you're creating a new custom module that you want to actually eventually contribute to the community, um, you'll basically make a directory called demo. In this case, we'll say demo. It's you know, a PHP, you're gonna use Drupal 8 um, nomenclatures and um, put the correct files in there. This is just a straight up index.php that I'm gonna be sort of talking about. So what your directory will look like is, you know, you'll have your index.php. So this is just a standard, simple, not a custom module, just a PHP web application that has a straight up index.php file in it. Then you'll, you'll initialize this project um, with Composer in it. This will create a composer.json file in there, which is where you're gonna put all of your specifications for what dependencies it might need. But this builds out a skeleton for you. So in this case, 
For this particular app, we're going to add a logging feature to it. I'm just going to walk you through how this logging feature looks like and how easy it is to take someone else's work and incorporate that into your work through Composer. So check out the PHP library that exists. So basically, you can go to Packagist or GitHub, and you'll find a lot of these libraries. So packagist.org has a lot of logging. So if you go in there and do a search for that, I think I, OK, yeah, this leads to it. So let's see. Sort of looks like this. You guys familiar with this? So everything pretty much is hosted on packagist.org. Drupal modules are hosted on our own drupal.org foundations repository. So you have to add that repository in your composer, and I'll show you what that looks like. But essentially, if you were looking for a package, you would just go in, say logging, and there's a lot of different ones that you can choose from. Symphonies, monologue, I think in our description, we used monologue. Um, so monologue, monologue, this is really important, this piece here. So what you'll eventually do is just do this command, which is composer require monologue, monologue. And that will pull in all of the files that's needed to actually use this feature in your application. So when you run the command, what just happened was that the command is going to discover, it's going to look for monologue slash monologue in packagist.org. It's going to essentially do a git clone. So it clones that down into your directory, into the vendor folder, and then it creates this composer.json, composer.log. Now what I didn't talk about is the version constraints. So based on that monologue slash monologue, it's going to pull the most stable or the recommended version that the maintainer has suggested. So it'll pull that in. But if you wanted a specific version, it would just be monologue slash monologue colon and then whatever version it is. And there's a few other sort of nuances around how you how you pick your specific version and branch um, from that particular repository. Let me stop there and see if there's any questions so far. Am I going too fast, too slow? Everything's good? All right. So once you've run that essential command, these are the things that are going to happen. So we had index.php, composer.json, and composer.lock was created when you ran that composer require. A vendor directory was created. The autoload PHP file or an autoloader was generated. And then you've got your composer dependencies that Omic puts in. And then you've got your monologue. And this PSR actually comes from monologue because monologue itself has a composer.json file in it that requires this other external library. So you can see how things get quickly uh, complex if you start pulling in more. This stopped at these two. So let's say PSR had four other dependencies in it. It would pull those in, and one of those dependencies also needed something else, and it would pull all those in. So the vendor directory gets complex, but with just one little command called composer require monologue mon, it does that discovery and finds everything that it needs to make sure that that feature is going to be able to run on your application itself. Just to be clear, uh, and Composer lock that information and by the Yeah, good question. So Composer JSON and Composer lock. I'm going to go into the differences in those. Yeah, so this Composer lock actually locks the version constraints in there. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the version constraints in a bit. Um, so from a, oh, go ahead. So this is assuming a Unix platform. Uh, a, a Nix platform, yeah. So this is all command line. So, so I am not it aware. Work in Windows, for example, it, it can. So if you're in PowerShell, you can. Um, typically, if you're doing Windows and you're developing a PHP site or a Drupal site for that matter, you'll want to be in some sort of um, box or lamp stack. PowerShell, I think, has ninety percent of the commands that a Linux machine would use, but there are some nuances. Um, but yeah, this assumes a Unix system that you're building off. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so here I kind of go into sort of what's in the monologue when they pull down that repository. So these are all the different files. That's the composer JSON that I was talking about. But 
just kind of showing a little bit how complex things can get. Um, so now how do you implement that library that you've pulled in? So remember our index.php file is pretty much empty at that point at this point right now. So what you'll do is essentially you'll add this line require dir vendor autoload.php. So remember when it created go back up, yep. When we did that composer require, it created this vendor and this autoload. This autoload will be for basically any application that you bring in. So all you need to do in your index.php, which is going to be sort of the starting point for your web application, is to include this autoload.php or require it, um, which looks like this line here. So once this line is added, all of the classes are now loaded and you can start using those classes directly within your application. So now you can do use monolog logger and it's going to find, PHP will actually find this class in the vendor directory. So you don't have to do all the mapping and making sure all those are included. Um, so it makes your life a whole lot easier. From a Drupal 8 perspective, same exact thing. If you open up index.php in your Drupal root, you'll see this required dir vendor autoload.php. It's a little bit different, it looks a little bit different, but it essentially points to this autoload.php which loads up every class that's needed for a Drupal application. Um, and then surprisingly, the index.php file in Drupal 8 compared to the one in Drupal 7 is like 20 lines shorter. I think it's only like six lines of code and it bootstraps the entire application. So it's really, it's really nice and you can hook into anything. Um, but back to this, basically it's going to call that and then you can start implementing your logger. So in this case here, we use the class. Now we've got our logger class that we can instantiate. Um, in this case, we're instantiated as my log, and then we can push a, a method to it. So in this case, we're pushing the handler, which is going to basically input my log. It's going to generate it and then it'll send out a, a message. So all of these methods are all now provided through those features. And this is a very simplistic application. <coughs> So if you were to execute your script now, after adding all of that code, you just do php minus f index.php, run, run a script from your command line. And the result would be cat my log, and the my log dot error is gonna be created with that message on there. So you'll actually see that, that message come out uh, because that's what the code is actually running and echoing out essentially to the terminal. So you can continue to add more things. And one, one popular one is obviously PHP code sniffer, which comes with Drupal 8. Um, and let's say we want to add this sniffer to just make sure our code is up to par. And you're going to use it during development. So we'll require it as a dev dependency. So when we did a composer require, it puts it in the required section of the composer JSON, which means your application whenever someone installs it, downloads it, and runs a composer install, it's going to make sure that it downloads everything that's in the required section or tagged required. Um, anything that's in the dev tag would not be installed if you put an extension on your composer install with dash dash no dev. It just knows, oh, this is production. We're not going to install these development libraries and packages as well. So um, that's what it would look like. You would just say compose require. In this case, it's Squiz Labs PHP code sniffer, um, same one that Drupal uses. And then this tag here, dash dash dev, is saying this is a development module. When it goes to production, we're not going to be installing this package. Now, this one is complex. So basically, this command is going to add Squiz Labs, oh, I guess it's not too bad, PHP code sniffer. Oh, I think I left out all the other stuff because it just got too big to show on here. PHP code sniffer is going to require a bunch of other parsing tools and things like that that it pulls in. It recreates the autoload to make sure that that's included into there. And then, as well as any of the dependencies on there, it redoes the composer.lock and then adds Squiz Labs to the composer.json file. And we'll see what that looks like, the end result. I think I've got that in here.
that basically allows you to do things like this on your command line. So if you do a dot vendor bin phpcs standard index, it'll pull out reports. So it's going to spit out a report, and you can see all the different things that are on there. Um, so basically, in less than 10 commands, so we did a composer init, a composer require. We went in and added the autoloader to our code. So we did our code development. We did a little bit of tests. And then basically, we added code sniffer with another composer require, did a composer update. And then you've got a full-fledged application that includes not just a logging utility, but also code sniffing tools for development. Uh, quick question, because someone who's never used a Composer before, so when you install package via Composer, then I don't have to change that index file. It st automatically starts auto-loading the classes that come down. Yes, once you've got that one require at the top, every time you add a new package, you don't ever have to change that. It's going to, okay. that auto-loader will change every time you add a new package. Yeah. Good question. Um, so I kind of summarized uh, the 10 different commands in there. So we made the directory, uh, you know, we called it my new project. We CD'd into it. We touched the index.php, which generated the blank file. We ran that composer in it. We went ahead and added monologue, monologue package to it. Wrote a few PHP lines. Then we did the test real quick, you know, just to see what it spits out and it creates that log file. Um, the cat my log is just to check and see if it did anything. It did. And then we did another composer require Squiz Labs to add the code sniffing utilities. Um, and then to check and make sure all that ran, you just did the dot vendor bin phpcs. Now, the reason there's this long thing in here is because even though phpcs, which comes with code sniffer, is a PHP script, we haven't added it to our path within our Linux system. So when you type in just php CS, it's not going to know where to go. So we're actually just telling it, oh, okay, this file is in vendor bin PHP CS. So now we're going to take a little bit of a deeper look. That was kind of the whole thing in a, in a quick snapshot. We'll start diving deep into what happened in each of those different steps. So this is a snapshot of the composer.json file. So when we ran composer in it, it generated basically this here. So when you actually run composer in it, it's going to ask you, it's going to prompt you for a few things. Um, I put in my name and my email. And then once you run the composer require, you'll see these two pieces here. Does this all make sense? Is it, is it clear? So maybe. Um, since this is pretty straightforward, let's see how long it takes. I'll open up a terminal. Let me open up another one. And we'll do those same, same sort of steps. So I'm in my root directory. Now if you're in Windows, you could open up PowerShell and do the same thing, as long as you have Composer and stuff installed in it. Um, or you could spin up a Drupal, uh, a virtual machine on your box and just SSH into it. But we'll do a make directory and let's say, in this case, we'll just call it uh, Drupal Delphia CD. And as you can see, empty directory. So what was the first step that we did was a composer in it. And I'm skipping the step of installing composer. So I have already composer installed. So I run composer in it, and this is the prompts that it's going to ask you. So package name, we'll call it, uh, you know, Marvin Uy, Drupaladelphia. Description, quick demo in session, um, it's mine. Minimum stability, so if you wanted, you know, to set something in terms of... I have a quick question. So before you do uh, run, before you run the composer on the command, how do you make sure that you're so in that case, you'll basically have to, you can do a composer self-update, mm -hmm. and that's going to make sure all the libraries are put in together. Now, you, there's a couple of things with composer that's required. Um, depending on how you download and upload it, you do need to have the right version of PHP on your local machine when you're running it. 
Um, other than that, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's essentially a pair package that you download and it's an ex executable. And if you follow those steps on that first slide that I showed or when you go to the site, it should, it should work properly. The only time it doesn't is if your PHP version is not compatible with that composer download that comes in. Here we're not going to go too much into the package types, um, but essentially when you run a composer install, depending on the type of package it is, you can give it different names, you can have it installed in different places. So it doesn't always have to be installed in the vendor directory. So in Drupal, if you notice, um, we actually can see that. When you do a composer install or a composer create project using um, you know, the instructions on drupal.org, the files or the the modules are not going to be put in vendor. They're actually going to be put in your doc root core or doc root modules, custom, different places. And that's where these come in. So if you're writing um, a theme or a profile in Drupal, it's actually the package type is going to be a, a profile or a theme. So, so it'll know what's going on. Um, license, if you have one, you put that in and then you basically just say yes. This is if we wanted to actually include other packages we know, know of. I'm going to go ahead and I actually put yes, but I'll just press enter. We're not going to add anything so that we can see it blank. So we'll say yes. So let's clear that. We'll do an ls and you'll see now because I ran that, the directory is not empty. It created this composer.json and I'll use my sublime to open that up. And this is what it generated for us. So it generated our composer.json no dot lock file because we haven't installed anything yet. And we basically got a sort of skeleton on here already. So let's go back to our, oops, window here. And the one thing that we added was the monologue. So we'll go composer, monologue, stash, monologue, oops. And this is the process that sometimes can take a while. So it's downloading all the packages, making sure everything's all set. It's going to do its thing. And as you can see, it's creating the JSON file, but not really recreating it, but it's adjusting it to add it. And then it's creating a lock file. Yeah. Oh, actually, it doesn't create a lock file. We haven't installed. So then it found some other dependencies. It pulls that down and creates those. So now we can take a look at what we have now. Oh, it did create a composer.lock. So it creates a composer.lock because it created some dependencies and then we've got our vendor directory in there. So if we go tree, we've got all these different files in there. Let's do a tree. And let's go down one more, two. You can see now it's got the vendor, the auto load that we said it generated, the composer, and then monologue and PSR. So essentially, We've done sort of this aspect of it. So we can do an SUBL, go in there. We've got that structure. And if you wanted to actually see, actually, let's look at our composer.json and see what changes it made. So by writing that composer require, you see that it added that require monologue monologue. So it added that into there. And then the other package that we wanted was that um, PHP code sniffer. So that would be composer. Oh. There's the Squiz Labs code sniffer, and then we add the dash dash dev. Let's not add the dash dash dev and see what happens. So it does the same thing, and it's doing its discovery and packages. Pulls down, creates that JSON, establishes a lock file, and then if we now go to, we see that it's put in this require section. I don't know what to call these, but sections. Um, let's remove Good that. Question. You have uh, versions there, um, at least 1.24. How is that determined? That's determined by the maintainer of the model of the package itself. Okay. Yeah, when they say minimum stability, that's the one that if you okay. don't put anything, it'll pick that one. So we update it. Everything will be updated. Yeah, okay. yeah. So based on what they've got tagged and released. So we can do the same thing, but we'll put dash dash dev. 
and it'll run through the same thing. It'll update the JSON file, and it, it moves it. Right. So now we've established it as only a development package, and so it puts it in that require dash dev. So how does that impact everything at this point? So now we're going to go ahead and install it. I'm not going to go through the code stuff. Um, we'll just kind of skip that because it'll take a while for me to type all that in. But let's say we do a composer install. And when you do everything, because we ran composer require, it actually goes through an install process, which is why the dot lock was created. Um, and a vendor was created. What I'm going to do is start from scratch, and typically what's committed to a repository for a project is just the composer.json file and the composer.log file, depending on you know what's been done. So I'm going to go ahead and blow away <coughs> those two so that I just have this composer.json file which looks like that. So we know that it's going to be a monologue and Squiz is going to be installed. So we'll do a composer install. And it's going to run through its thing. It's installing those pieces. And when we do an LS, we've got our composer.lock file generated based on the constraints that were in JSON and then the vendor directory. Now what we'll see is if we go into the vendor directory, oops, we've got the monologue and the squiz labs. Because we didn't say, we just by default, it's going to install everything, including the development packages. So let's start over again, just to see, just so that you can see what happens if you do a composer install and we do a dash dash no dev. So this is basically saying, hey, we want to install, we're going to be doing this production now. Let's not install the development packages because it's too big and it's huge for the footprint. So you'll do that. It's going to run through it and it's only going to install what's in the require section. So it only installed monologue. We can come up here. If we go into the vendor directory, you see that it only has monologue and PSR. So that's essentially what happens when you put those pieces on there. So when you're doing deployment, you're going to have different builds as they, as they deploy out. Uh, let's see, let's go back. So that was sort of a quick actually did the what we showed on here except minus the code pieces of it that's on, that's on there. Um, so before we get into the version best practice, any, any questions on what you saw? Did that make sense? So when you mark something as required dev, um, does that only control control when you do a composer install? Or is there a way you could say, like say in your index.php, I'm running the dev version right now, like I have full code base and then I'll, I'll load those dev libraries, but I, or I'm not running dev, I'm just not going to load them, you have the same code base either way. Does that make sense? Uh, in other words, if you install no dev, it's not, it, you, you, it's not downloading those dev libraries at all. As yes, as no, it's not, it's not at all. So could you have it install the dev libraries, but tell it just not to load them? So, or is that just not standard practice? It's not standard practice, okay. yeah. yeah. So, so when you're doing development, you'll have that. And then when you do the no dev, it's rare that you'll ever do like a no dev. Mm -hmm. um, when you deploy, that's when the dash dash no dev is, is attached on that, yeah. Okay, I was just wondering if that's something you would control like from you know your script itself, or is it only part of the install process? It's only part of the install yeah, process, right. yeah, yeah. And one thing to keep in mind is that no, just because it's in the require dash dev doesn't mean that when Composer tries to go through its iterations on finding dependencies, one of the biggest pains with Composer is that it's actually going to check the require dash dev. So um, this is where versions get complex. You may have a development package that requires, let's say, for example, Monolog, but it requires a certain version of Monolog, right? Even though you do a no dev, it's going to see that, hey, there's another package that requires Monolog, but it requires this, this one, and it's a lower version. It'll, it'll conflict out and it won't install because it's going to say, 
hey, your version for monologue is locked down to one, but your, your dev package requires version two. And so it gets locked down. So those are the issues that, that kind of happen. What was the difference between um, dev and no dev when you're doing the composer update? So no, no difference. When you do a composer update, it's going to, it's basically going to default to actually updating also what's in required dash dev. So that's another area where if you do a composer install with dash dash no dev, and then you do a composer update, it'll run as part of the update, a composer install of those required dash devs. It'll like redo it all. So it'll install it on there. Now, if you do a composer update dash dash no update, it's going to error because there's no tag for composer update. So composer update updates everything in there, which kind of goes in line with it just checks all the, the dependencies even when you're even when you say no dev. If that makes sense. Any other questions? Um, so version best practices for each dependency we typically want the latest version that won't break our site, that's obvious. Um, but if we just get the latest version of everything, things will break. And so that's why we have version constraints. Um, so there's the balance, and then you've got the major, minor, and, and patch versions on that. Um, and they try, most maintainers try to stick to semantic, um, but it's not always the case. And that's, that's where Composer dependency management using Composer can get very difficult, um, especially with complex projects like, like Drupal. So the carrot. So there are different constraints on there. Um, this is equivalent to, you know, basically if you put a caret 1.2.3, it's going to install whatever is the latest. So if there's a if there's a 1.2.9, it will, even though it has 1.2.3, it's going to install the 1.2.9, um, but it won't install two because that's that's not backward compatible according to definitions. So. Depending on the number of digits you put in, that's what the last digits was going to be updated to. Um, this is the recommended approach, so most folks are going to have the carrots. Um, the tilde works a little bit different. This one, in this case, it's greater than or equal to 1.2.3 and then 1.3.0. So same process, but it's going to include this one. And then it'll allow the last digit to go up, but not the second digit. So if there's a 1.3.0, it's not going to go to it. It'll only go up to 1.2.9 or whatever the highest is, 1.2.100. But it won't ever go up to 1.3 if, if it exists. So where's the tilde? Oh, well, where, where do we put that? Oh, I think I messed up on here. There's a typo. Good catch. That should be a tilde. <laughs> Um, and then you can get very specific with your own rules. And you can say greater than or equal to. This is really rare, um, mostly in dev. When you're doing some dev and you're doing bug fixes and you need to constrain it, um, you'll put those in there like that. Um, and then you even have asterisks. So this is getting really into the weeds, but most of the time you're always going to want to use um, the caret or the tilde to fix something that's in there. <coughs> um, and then when you're really, really have to, you can do an exact version where you don't put anything on there and it will always lock to that version. This is where I get, you can even specify branch. So you have to put dev dash depending on the nomenclature on there. And this gets pretty, pretty advanced where if you have a master branch and you want to just check out the master branch and the head at the master branch, you would put the, the version as so monologue, monologue, colon, dev dash master, that will clone the master branch of that repository as the code that you're gonna use for your package. Um, if you don't put dev dash in front of it, Composer thinks it's a tag. So if that tag doesn't exist, if a master type doesn't, it's gonna say, oh, I couldn't find anything. So that's a, a thing to remember is that you need to have that dev dash. That tells Composer you're checking out a branch. Now we mentioned that, and then this is just sort of why we do these things. Um, so essentially, this is sort of something, you know, Matt and, and Jeff put together this pretty cool thing. We're basically saying, hey, require. So 
He is packagist. And this is your application and it's saying, hey, give me monolog, monolog version 2.0. I notice there's no constraints on there. It's just the exact version of 2.0. He comes back and says, oh, there is no monolog 2.0. So you need to fix something on that. And he goes, oh, okay, so we'll fix that. We're gonna say, give me you know, 1.0, anything above that. And he goes, sure, here, take 1.230 on the house. So basically he's saying, the version before 2.0 is 1.23, and you're gonna get this one. And so that's essentially how composer packages kind of works. The composer.lock file, really important. You're gonna always wanna commit this to your repository. And I don't know if I talk about that, let's see. Yeah, I do, okay. So where composer.lock plays an important role is when you're installing stuff. So as I mentioned here, fundamentally, if a composer.lock file exists, it's going to change the way it install, installs its packages or finds and picks the versions that, it, that it's going to install. So if the composer lock does not exist, composer install is going to discover all available dependency versions. So it's going to go through that comic piece where it's going to try and find, based on the constraints, which version it needs, and then create a composer.lock file. So it's going to look at composer.json, get the constraints from there, <coughs> do its iterations, find the latest you know, versions that it needs to pull in, and create the lock file based on that. If the composer.lock file does exist, composer install is going to install the exact dependencies defined in composer.lock. So it doesn't even look at the composer.json file. It just goes straight to composer.lock and installs the versions in there. So what this does is when you commit that lock file and you're on a you're the team lead or the tech lead for a project and you've got three developers that are coming on board, they're gonna build their project from scratch. They would basically run a composer install and they would have the exact versions of the packages on their machines and not, you know, updated ones and people get, you know, issues and things like that. So that's really important in terms of team management when you're doing development. Um, so once you're locked in, Composer Update is going to discover all available dependency versions. So this is where things are going to change in the sense of it's actually going to look at the required dash dev to make sure nothing has changed there. And it's going to create a new lock file when you do a Composer Update. So that you have to be careful about when someone does a Composer Update. And that's similar to a Composer Require as well. So as a tech lead, if you are managing a team and you're doing composer updates and someone's requiring a new package, that's when the pull requests that come in are really important. You really need to look at that and make sure it's not altering other things in there. So composer.lock, you're always going to commit, but you don't commit the vendor directory. So that's really important, except the only time you do have to commit the vendor directory is if you're deploying to your production, right? Because your production means the vendor. Unless your production server actually builds it on the production server, which is rare, it's always going to build somewhere, and then create the artifact, and then, and then push that artifact out to production. So um, when you pull down a project, say you join a team, and you pull down a project, and you clone it, and you see vendor directory in there, you probably want to raise your hand and be like, hey, something's wrong here, I've got, you gave me a repository that has a vendor directory in it, what's going on? So obviously there's advantages. The vendor directory can be pretty huge. Um, I think I did that twice. And then these are just reasons for, you know, people get been out of shape where there's no vendor directory, you have to build it every time, but it is best practice. Um, so that was composer general overview. Now the Drupal specific things. Um, so like usual, Drupal complicates things a little bit. Um, and as I mentioned, Drupal modules aren't on Packagist, so you can't search for them on Packagist, you search for them on Drupal.org. Um, Drupal doesn't really use semantic versioning. So you got 8.x-2.0, right? That's not semantic. 
Um, and then Drupal doesn't install the modules, themes, etc., in the vendor directory. So it uses the Composer install plugin to point where it needs to go, which isn't bad because we've got scaffolds, and Drupal actually provides scaffolds for for you to use as a skeleton um, Composer JSON skeleton file to use. Uh, so these are the Composer templates for Drupal projects when you're starting off. So we're now kind of getting into, okay, how do you start off a Drupal 8 project properly? And this is just a few of the Composer files that you're going to want to use when you're starting off on a new project. So the first one is obviously the one that's provided by Drupal.org itself, which is the Drupal Composer Drupal project. And that's going to install just vanilla Drupal standard as if you did in the old days, Drupal 7. Um, you downloaded it directly from .org. This is basically the same thing, but you're using Composer. The other one is, I have to throw in our Lightning. So Acquia has their distribution that they provide. It's called Lightning. If you haven't heard of it, um, you can check it out by doing a Composer on Lightning-Project. And I can show you what that looks like as well. And then the other two that I showed is BLT project, which is build launch tool, which comes with a whole bunch of really cool tools to deploy, do tests, be hat. So this composer file in this project has a lot of really cool features. Forewarning, these two are very complex composer. So when you add things, you get conflicts and there's certain ways to get things turned on. So for example, if you do lightning dash project and you try and require Drupal console, there's a specific way you have to add Drupal console. Um, and so there's like challenges in that. Same with BLT. And then the last one is um, I have to throw in because of the popularity of headless Drupal or decoupled Drupal architectures now is the Contenta JSON API project. So basically that, if you use that project, it's going to pull down Contenta's distribution for Drupal, which is based off of Lightning. And then it also includes all of the JSON API spec modules and libraries that's needed to make it a pretty pretty nice headless uh, you know, Drupal instance. So let's do, um, I don't know how long it'll take, I'll just run it, and then as it's running, we can, I can answer some questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this, pro this, this particular command. Come up here. These tags here, or these extensions, you can override what's in what the maintainer has done. So right now what I'm saying is, hey, get the dev version, which is going to pull down the latest. If you don't put that, it's just going to pull down the latest release. So no interaction, basically no prompts. Like a lot of times it'll ask you like, oh, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? So we'll keep, we'll keep the um, stability, we won't override the stability. And then, so just to decompose this command, you've got your composer, create project does two things. It's gonna clone it and it's gonna run composer install at the same time. That's all it does. Um, and it's gonna do these two things. We actually give it this version, but since we don't wanna do the stability, we're just gonna, oops. Leave that out and we'll see which version it pulls down. And then no interaction because we don't want problems. Um, two L's and Drupal. Oh. I guess I'm happy oh yeah. So um, so this is the the repository. This right here is the directory it's going to put it in. So it's going to put it in this. Directory. If you don't put a directory, it'll it'll put it in Drupal dash project, whatever the name of, of that project is. So at this point, it's going to start pulling through, start creating all the JSON file, things like that. Um, oh. oh, so it doesn't have one. So we actually do have to put in. That piece on there. 
So the maintainer for our Drupal dash project or the the organization, they actually call out. They don't have a tag on there. Oh, that's right. That's how they do that. So basically, they got 8.x dev. That's going to be tagged to the latest release on there. So it's going to pull down that that machine that basic version. So we'll do that. And the instructions for pulling it down is going to be in the Drupal project file itself. So when you go to drupal.org slash project Drupal, it'll say, hey, here's the composer command that, that you should use to install it. Um, Contenta and BLT also has the same thing. So there's specific things on there that you have to do on there. And they, they always have some steps on how they want to install. Contenta is a little bit weird as well. Um, so we'll do that. So any questions as we wait for everything to get downloaded? So as you can see, Drupal has a lot of stuff. Um, there's the guzzle. Half of this stuff, I don't even know what it does. Nor do we need to, right? It's a nice black box approach, which is hard to get used to, but it is doing it. And it's going to also be installing, like a lot of it, I would say probably 60% of it is also dev modules or packages that are also being installed. So if you did a a no dev would probably be a lot shorter. Um, but it's still going to go through all the dependency checks to make sure that all those dependencies come in. So it's pulling 8.7.1. I think that is the, the latest release. Um, depending on how your how production is hosted, um, you typically wouldn't push directly. If if you're so, you would have to push your vendor directory to the to the production environment. So you do your build, and then actually commit your vendor directory. Okay. So I I probably should use the you know that that slide that's really development related. So when you're developing. Yeah, you wouldn't want to push that up. Okay. I'm better now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, oh, that wasn't that wasn't quite as bad. So everything's been pulled down, and we can actually look to see what happened on that. So um, what did I call the directory? Demo Drupal CD. Drupal. So basically, when we ran that Composer Create project, it created our, our Drupal code base for us already. We've got our vendor directory, and we've got a web directory. So our script within composer.json creates the web directory, which is actually going to have the Drupal core in it. So if we go into CD web, here is our actual Drupal code root, this is the Drupal root itself. So you can see the index.php, there are the core files, the sites, and the themes. And those are that's how everything gets put in. And then just for the fun of it, we can actually look at the index.php. So here's the index.php. This is the file that starts everything for Drupal. And you can see it has this auto loader. So it's going to auto load that PHP in there. Then it gets the kernel, pulls in, this is Symfony, and then everything gets created at that point. So um, so that's generally how that works with that. This basically loads everything up. You take that out, nothing will work. Let's go into the vendor directory. And here you can actually see the actual. Here you actually see the actual packages themselves. So you can see all the different packages on here. If we didn't use the composer create project from Drupal composer dash composer, 
all of those modules and themes and profiles would actually be in this directory because that's how it's defaulted. So let's actually take a look at this is the composer.json file that is provided in that composer uh, what was it that we had? The Drupal composer Drupal project composer file. So here you can see the type is project, so now it knows that it's an actual project, um, the authors, and then here are your require. So really all it's requiring is these and then the required dev. Now there was a whole bunch of other modules that were in there, but if we actually go into Webflow and look at all these different ones, they also have required dash devs, so, so everything starts to mess in. Um, Composer provides scripts capability, and this is where you start customizing the actual Composer install itself. So these are some of the install scripts that it adds to it, um, but this is the plugin. So this extra is a Composer section where you can start putting different actions in it. So in this case here, there's an installer pass. Composer has an installer plugin where it basically says web slash core are gonna go, you know, Basically, any package that's of type Drupal-core is going to go into the web slash core directory. Um, and that's similar. So any types that are Drupal-library is going to go into the, the libraries. And we can see what how that's defined if we actually go. Right, we know that they were putting, there's no libraries in this, there's, so. No composer.json here. Oh yeah, you know what, it's not gonna be in here. So one of the things that it does is it cleans up. So in the process, it's gonna clean up our modules and take out you know, any .gits and anything like that because it's really doing clones of everything. It cleans that all out because when you do a composer and you're trying to push to, to production, it won't commit some of those files in there. So it, it does a little bit of sanitation to make sure everything is clear. So I can't really show some of that to you. And Drupal.org's packages doesn't, is not exposed. Let me find something else and see. Not ah, profiles. Let's look at profiles. No, oh, it didn't pull anything in. So what we could do is actually show what that looks like. So how many of you have heard of the Umami or Umami? Yeah. So that's that demo that's coming out in core. It doesn't, it's not actually included. You actually have to require that. So we can actually come in here and say, hey, we want to implement the composer or the Umami theme. So you can do composer require. I think it's Drupal slash Umami. So what this is going to do is going to pull in the Umami. Yep. Um, it's using an old version, but there's no conflict, but it created everything and everything was fine. So if we go into CBL, where did I put it? Oh, that was the theme. So I pulled in the theme. The actual profile is called uh, demo. So what we did was we actually pulled the theme, and if you go into this composer.json, it says, uh, it doesn't have it in here, the type is a, is a theme, so that's why it knew to put it inside of themes contrib in Umami. Let's pull in Drupal. And this one, this one's actually going to pull in the uh, the profile itself.
No, so it looks like the umami theme requires the, the portfolio theme. So we generated those. If we go in, no, it's not putting it in there. Where is it sticking in now? Because they're in the process of incorporating demo the Umami profile, they're actually having it installed in in the actual core itself. So so it actually put it in, in demo Umami. So we can actually let's see if Yeah, see it cleaned it out. So anything that goes into core gets cleaned out. But if we uh, it might take me a while to, to clone that down. If you were to actually clone it down from the repository itself using So essentially every project module is going to have the same name so the repository will always be the same. We can go in and look at the versions. Oh yeah, this is an interesting one because they're incorporating it into they have it locked down. All right. So only only a few people have access to it as they work on that. Maybe you need to do the QSSI more Yeah, I mean, it's in there. I just wanted to actually pull down the actual code itself and see the commits and things like that and show you how the commits are being done. Unfortunately, you can. But that's all right. But that's that's basically how you'd pull that in. If there are other themes in there, you can pull in or or profiles that you want to pull in, you can as well. Similar similar process. So if we did uh, like GraphQL. That'll pull in GraphQL. And they will actually put it inside of the modules directory. In, under control. And this one pulls in quite a few. And if we go to our modules, oh, I'm in core. our GraphQL, and this should have the composer.json. So here's this piece. The type is a Drupal module, so that's how I knew to stick it inside the contrib modules. And then it pulled in its own vendor directory, but it put it vendors inside of the vendors directory of the project itself, so it pulls all those pieces in. So that's kind of nice on there. And here's that minimum stability as dev. And it pulls in the WebOnyx GraphQL. back to my slides and see what else I wanted to talk about real quick. Just in terms of the nomenclature, the way we've done it is basically if the Drupal module is 8.x-1.1, the way it get converts is you just add that last digit 1.1.0 and that's how, that's how basically we're converting it. So 8.x-1.1 is basically the equivalent of the semantic 1.1.0. And then here's other examples. So an 8.x 3.4 would then become the 3.4.0. So when you're basically doing your composer require and you want this specific version, you would put 3.4.0. If it was 3.5, you would put 3.5. 
Um, RC2, same thing. This one's a little bit tricky. You'd have to put the dev in front of it, um, which I didn't add in the translated server. But when you actually do your composer require, it would be composer require, whatever the module is, dev dash 2.10.0 dash RC2. So it knows that it's that branch. And then that's end of those slides. But I wanted to make sure that there was any questions or maybe answer any questions that you might have in terms of you know, installing with Drupal 8 with Composer. I know it's kind of a, a quick, it's a lot to ingest when it comes to Composer. Any challenges that you guys have been facing? So what, what would be your recommendation in the case you were Say you've got a system built. You have something in production, um, and you have developers working in development branches and pushing on feature branches for merge. Um, and if you lock things down in the lock file and you do a composer update because you want to update something that you changed you end up having to re-regression test everything because it pulls in modules that you did not want to put in because there are updates to them. Now, I, I've been pushing to have people put specific version constraints in the composer.json and there's some resistance to that. Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, I, it, it gets tough when you're doing at the beginning of a project and people are doing, you know, you're still sort of architecting out what modules you want to use and you're putting those in. Um, it really comes down to, well, I recommend it. A, we call it a dictatorial merge approval. One person manages basically any merge that comes in at any point in time. Meaning, not so much that it's just only one person it's just one person given for a given sprint would be in charge of it. So the way we set it up is that for every sprint, someone becomes the approval manager. So everyone knows this person is gonna be tracking. Their sole responsibility is to make sure that there aren't major updates like that that's gonna impact something. So right, like what you said, Composer require, it's gonna update everything in there. And if the time between that person did an update and the last commit, and there were three or four external you know, packages that updated and introduced some you know, breaking changes that will affect everything else on that. And if that's the case, typically that manager will say, we're gonna pull it in because it's needed. Now everyone needs to pull that in and rebuild and make sure their stuff isn't broken. Because eventually they have to fix it anyway. So if, there's, if their code is broken, but that's typically how we, we manage those pieces on that. That's a good question. It's a, it's a major headache. Not to mention dev, when you have the dev packages that are in there that conflict. Anything else? Great, well thanks, I guess I can give you back 10, 20 minutes.